Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. Hey, folks, welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities. I am your host, John Brackett, another great show here where we talk about different strategies that we can use to take average apartment buildings and turn them into amazing communities. I have another great guest. His name is Jason DeBono. And uh, Jason is in the self-directed IRA space. So for many of you, that your ears are going to start ringing right now. And for another portion of you, you may have heard of a self-directed custodian. Now you're going to learn a lot more about that. And I think more importantly, understand the value that not only that can bring to you, but for those of you that are operators to your investors as well. So Jason, welcome to the show, bud. Hey, thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Hey, so let me introduce you as our guest. Jason graduated from the University of Central Florida, and you've been in this space now for about 15 years in the self-directed IRA space. So he serves as both Director of Business Development and Director of Operations for Newview Trust Company, which is a self-directed custodian with about $1.4 billion of assets under custody. Now, in his role currently, you're Corporate Vice President, and you see the data activities of the company. Now, you get asked to speak a lot on different podcasts, and it sounds like different national events as well. And so it's my understanding that you also provide continuous education training for CPAs and attorneys and other real estate professionals out there in the marketplace. Now, I think one of the cool things that I see here that you're very actively involved in is Share the Love, which is an organization that provides wheelchair and mobility-related services to those in need. So We're going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the show. I'm sure that'd be something that you really want to share with our audience. It sounds like a great cause. We've also funded a gentleman, and this was probably about three years ago, maybe more than that, about four years ago, very similar organization. And we did this, we sent him, I believe it was somewhere down in South America. And man, it was awesome to see the pictures once we got them back. You know, we sponsored him. He had no idea who he was. We wanted to stay anonymous, but what an amazing, amazing time this kid has. What we did ask for were were all the pictures, right? So they sent us all these photos. So when I saw that, it resonated with me. Anyways, just wanted to touch on that a little bit. I thought, I think it's a great cause. But hey, man, welcome to the show and really excited to get into this conversation with you. Yeah, looking forward to it. A lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. So hey, share your story and how you actually got into this space, right? Because it's a very unique niche. And one of the things that I think will make this a great conversation is you're in a position where you get to see a lot of money moving around, right? So in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty and people are always trying to figure out the next place to place capital, I always say, find the money, right? Look for the money, figure out where the money's shifting. So talk to us a little bit about your background and how you got into this space. Well, you know, it's always a fun story to talk about because it was a lot of certainly chance circumstance And I'd say a lot of luck. I think it's been a few careers, in my opinion, that can be equally as rewarding in your personal life as they are in your professional life. And being able to live vicariously through our clients and seeing, you know, to your point where money's moving and what they're doing and investment strategies is, you know, really paid major dividends for me personally. But professionally, my story really starts right at the end of college. I was like most college kids. I was just trying to get my degree. I had a job working in, uh, in retail and I got to the point where I thought, you know, man, I've got one semester or so of college left. Let me go out and find an internship or something. You know, I'm looking for some experience. So I went to an, an internship expo that, that the university put on and I met a lot of great companies. And I don't quite know what attracted me specifically, you know, to go talk to their booth or whatever. But I do know I interviewed with about five or six companies and I'm here in Orlando, SeaWorld and we Callaway Golf and, you know, companies that are household names and you know what they do and you know what their product is. But I remember getting to Newview and I couldn't figure out what they did. You know, I just wasn't 100% sure. I mean, here I am, a 20 something year old college student just trying to figure life out. I don't know what an IRA is or anything along those lines. So I called my dad, and really it was my dad's reaction and response that caused me to take the job. I was intrigued. It was a tiny company at the time, it was a startup. They were helping people buy unique assets and retirement accounts. And my dad told me a kind of funny story is when I called my dad, he said, You can't do that. You can't buy real estate in an IRA. I've asked my broker and he told me that you couldn't do it. And so dad says, no, I'm obviously more intrigued. So 
you know, I left that interview thinking, man, this is a tiny company that has a lot of opportunity. And I looked at my dad and thought, my dad is a typical baby boomer. He's uh, very middle class to lower middle class, you know, never been rich and wealthy, never had financial advisors giving him all the scoop. But here's someone that wanted to do this, that always has bought and sold a couple of properties. His whole life, he's always owned multiple properties here and there, traditional, you know, novice real estate investor. Right. And he's been told he couldn't do this. And so it was really exciting to get into this business and learn. And I've spent the last 15 years not only helping people take their retirement money and do what really the Main Street brokerage house mentality has said no to. And it's been fun to watch people go out and invest in what they know and what they understand and certainly living vicariously through a lot of smart clients has been a fun ride. I really appreciate the backdrop. You know, why do you think that is? Why do you think that there's still a lot of folks out there that are unaware that they can self-direct their 401k dollars or their IRA dollars? Why do you think that is? Well, you know, so... In the last 15 years, certainly that's changed a lot. I mean, when I got in front of a room 15 years ago and said, how many people in here know that you can buy real estate or something unique in an IRA, if one or two people raised their hands, I'd be surprised. Today, about a third of the room raises their hands, especially if they seek education, if they attend a lot of educational events, listen to podcasts like this, certainly they're going to be a lot more in the know. But we're seeing that grow. I think it's really a couple things. One, lack of investment curiosity from the consumer, right? So those listening that don't know this, I'm gonna put a little bit of this right square on your shoulders. You live in an information age, right? A quick Google search on your cell phone would get you answers to most of these things. But then I also kind of want to turn it to, where's the incentive for anyone that's controlling the financial dollars today to tell them that, right? Schwab and Fidelity and Merrill Lynch, they're great companies. I certainly have nothing against them and their business model is fantastic. But there's no incentive for them to say, hey, John, you know what, you're a real estate guy let's not buy any more stocks. Let me show you how to use your IRA to buy something unique. So, you know, it'd be like going into McDonald's and them saying, you know, you you look like you're in the mood for a taco today. So let me point you down the road to a taco shop. It's just not their business model. And in the world we live in today, the big banks and brokerages control the money. And obviously they control the education as well. So messaging. Yes. (laughs) So we're just talking marketeers. That's a big piece of it too, John. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the trends, right? Because you mentioned that more people are being exposed to the options that they have with self-directing either their IRA or 401k dollars or retirement dollars for that matter. Talk about the trends that you're seeing right now in this space. So, you know, I look at self-direction and I break it down into three types of investors, right? There's passive, there's active, and then there's the hybrid. So What's unique about self-direction is so many people think, and really many, many years ago, self-direction was really exclusively about, I, Jason, am going to go out and find the right property. I'm going to figure out whether I'm going to rehab it or I'm going to figure out if I'm going to rent it, whatever that detail was. And when I say those are active investors, meaning they did all the legwork, right? That world has shifted a lot because there's lots of passive opportunities that are just simply private. So the other end of that, right, is syndication deals, non-traded REIT products, investing into private companies. These are really the legwork of the investment is not there, right? So I meet someone that's starting a restaurant or I meet someone that needs to borrow money or whatever it is. So I'm not chasing deals, right? I'm not out pounding the pavement trying to find them. I'm very passive. So I may put 50,000 bucks into an apartment complex in Texas and I do nothing. I don't have to find it. I just mailbox money. And then the hybrid is we start to see a lot of our clients live. And that is, They understand real estate, they can do their due diligence, they could go find it, but they're willing to let someone else source it for them. So they're still using their own knowledge and expertise to underwrite, if you will, the deal and to do their due diligence. So they're moderately active from a self-direction standpoint. They're not completely, here's my money, tell me how it did at the end of the month, but they're still investing into passive-based investments, syndicated deals or you know, we see a lot of that. Obviously, you know, I know multifamily is something that you work closely with. I mean, that's probably the biggest area of real estate syndication we're seeing right now is people investing into apartment communities all over the United States and redevelopment, ground up. I mean, we see it all. But deals like that is really what's broadening self-direction because at its core, if the only type of investor in a self-directed account was your traditional active real estate investor, that's a pretty small pool of people in the public. Sure. But now that it's been opened up and really more opportunities and more people that are raising money and putting deals together are realizing, hey, I'm raising $10 million to go rehab or 
to go do a value add apartment community, I need to know that not only can my investors use their IRA, but what they're finding is it's actually more advantageous for their investors to use it. It's not just another way to pay. It's actually a better, in most cases, depending on the deal, better way to pay. And so why do you say that? Why do you say, depending on the deal, and in most cases, it's a better way to pay? Can you elaborate on that a little bit for our audience? Yeah. And obviously, everything I say is with an asterisk, right? Meaning it doesn't fit every possible situation. I get it. I get it. Self-direction lends itself for exceptions. But from a rule standpoint, well, if you look at most syndications, they tend to be illiquid, right? So I can't just go sell it. So if I buy a stock, I can buy it today and sell it tomorrow. But if I invest into a, let's just call it a Texas-based apartment complex, I may be in that deal for three to five years, five to seven years, depending on how that deal shakes out. So it's illiquid. The second thing is, is hopefully it's going to generate above average returns. So there's tax liability. Right. Um, when The third thing is, not only is it illiquid, but because of the long-term tenure of the deal, it may not be the best place for me to tie up my personal money. So if I look at all three of those things and think, if I use my IRA, my IRA is already illiquid. So buying an illiquid asset in an illiquid vehicle, it's nicely. Again, again. Using my IRA, which is tax advantage, in an investment that I believe is going to generate above average returns is attractive. And lastly, by using my IRA, I keep my personal cash free so that if I do have a college bill to pay for kids or you know life gets in the way, I'm not looking at myself going, man, I really wish I didn't put 50 grand into that deal. Now I'm stuck and now I'm trying to go take a second out of my house to pay a couple bills when I would have just had the 50 grand sitting in the bank. Awesome. I really appreciate you hitting all those bullet points. So I'm going to shift a little bit, right? Right now we're in a world that is changing as a result of COVID-19. And, you know, it's changing the real estate landscape and likely will change it forever, right? And so one of the things that I get approached on all the time is, hey, where are you seeing the opportunity? And my response to folks, and I actually shared a post that highlighted our strategy a little bit and because I didn't think many people really talked about different ways to find investments. I think the common theme that I hear out there is, right, chase job growth, chase population growth. Okay, those are just common conversations that I hear, but I don't hear a lot of details behind that, right? So we shared a couple of things that I thought might help people identify some opportunities, at least through our lens. Not that it's right, but it's just what we use. So in your case, a little bit different, right? I always tell people, look, if you really want to understand what the opportunities are, you know, you got to follow the money. But the other side of that too is, you know, our philosophy has always been going the opposite direction of the masses, right? (laughs) Going the complete opposite direction of the masses. So can you talk to us a little bit about where you see the money going now? Where are you seeing a lot of money being self-directed into? Because I think that'll give everybody some idea as to what's going on from the perspective of investors, right? How investors are seeing opportunity based on where they're putting their dollars. Yeah, and, and I'll answer that question first by stating from my perspective, and keep in mind, I started in this business in 05. So I've seen run-ups and run-downs and run-ups and run-downs. And there's cycles and cycles happen in all investments. It's just the nature of investing. So I only say that, preface it with that, just so that everyone understands, it's still a little bit early to understand where opportunity is going to be in this market because we're in the middle of it. You really have two things, right? And being in Florida, we've been the epicenter, right, of the pandemic a month ago or three weeks ago. And now, you know, things seem to be back to normal. So things can change very fast, right? And so we're in the middle of this pandemic. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. So, but we do have two things that we all have to be aware of. Number one is we have an economy right? And that economy had ebbs and flows. And then number two, we have a pandemic. They're two completely different things. And I think in some unfortunate cases, people are kind of doing this with it, right? They're lumping the two together. And I think from an investment standpoint, you can't make pandemic investments without understanding what will happen to the underlying economy post-pandemic. They're two different things. So in every ebb and flow, there's winners, there's losers. We've seen this look at the stock market, right? There's certain stocks, if you bought Zoom pre-pandemic, you look like a genius, right? I mean, there's things, there's winners and (laughs) Uh, lose. That's a good one, man. And to tell you how bad of a stock investor I am, I sold Amazon, Apple, and Netflix, honest to God, just about (laughs) at the very bottom. So, you know, but it it was the best decision Uh, to make because I just don't know enough. And so 
I'm not kicking myself now because they're all up. What's the long-term viability, right? Are they winners sure. because it's a pandemic or are they winners in the long term? So kind of getting back to the question, the opportunities that are presenting themselves and will presenting themselves probably are more short-term than long-term. You know, there's a lot of short-term disruption. I mean, if you're looking from the outside in in the short term, man, it's scary to own commercial real estate. It's scary to be in anything that has rental. But that's largely due to moratoriums that have been put on foreclosure and rent. That's largely due to a shift in behavior to working from home. All of that said, people are assuming that everything will stay the same. If you remember after September 11th, they said people will never work in high rises again, right? Yet go to any city and every high rise is still doing just fine. So whether or not we end up with this full-time remote work and all of that, you know, I don't know. What I do know is that not everybody likes it. And I do know that we will have to come back to center, whether center is closer to more people working or less. The second thing is real estate. Right now, you're seeing a lot of challenges in the real estate market, although you have lots of things that are fueling its growth. Low interest rates, right? Every time interest rates drop, your purchasing power gets better. So if you think you're going to wait for the property to drop 20 grand or 30 grand to buy it, that may not be the best bet because a slight uptick in interest rates will actually cost you more. So there's some interest rate. There's a lot of government intervention that's artificially making these investments better in the short term, maybe than the long term. So when all of that's said and done and we get past the pandemic, the real pandemic, which is the government forcibly telling people they can't work. And I'm not saying that in a political comment, but it's the reality, right? The government is making the decisions on what businesses can open and what can't. That's not an an environment that's real. That's an environment that's pandemic based. So when that goes away, are the restaurants at 50% going to continue and be prosperous at 100%? Maybe, maybe not. Are all of the shadow inventory of rent collection and other things that we can't foreclose on people right now or we can't evict, what happens when that comes back? On the mortgage side, lenders have a lot of opportunity because I can say, John, you haven't paid your mortgage in four months but I'm going to add four years at the end. So the real cost to me as a company is just defrayed costs, right? It's future value of money versus present. Sure. But if you're a tenant in my rental house or in my apartment community and you're four months behind, there's no incentive for you to get back current. So for me to be able to keep you in there, and I'm not suggesting everyone's going to pack their bags and skip out, but let's face it, if there's zero incentive for you to stay, you're going to pack your bags and go to a new place and keep four months of rent. So, you know, I'm an apartment investor personally. I own real estate investments as well. So I think for all of us, and even from a client standpoint, we're seeing the same thing, which is people are still investing. People are still, but everybody's very cautiously optimistic about what really happens when the dust settles. And there's still a ton of unknowns right now. Our client's behavior really hasn't changed much. We are back to almost on every statistical category, pre-COVID levels for all of our asset classes. So we haven't seen any major drop-offs where people stop buying something. We've seen a slight uptick in precious metals. We've seen more activity in cryptocurrency as those tend to are kind of the new buzzword for hedge. But we're seeing a tremendous amount of real estate activity. And I think what you're finding is a lot of people that want to get out of real estate because they're worried about what the future holds and it's creating some buying opportunities for those ready to get in. Okay, so let me unpack some of that a little bit. You talk about you seeing money shifting to precious metals, right? And usually in environments that can be potentially inflationary, you start seeing people buy real assets or money shift to real assets. So here's a question that I've always been curious about as it relates to self-directed IRA money. There's always a lag in the economy, right? So anytime there's a decision that's made by the Fed, Usually there's a lag. Once that decision is implemented, monetary policy is implemented, there's a lag. In many cases, the benefit of that lag, we don't see until six, in most cases, 12 months, right? So how long is the lag from when you see something happen in the market to where self-directed IRA money starts getting active again? Because that's the signal for more money actually being deployed, right? Investment dollars. Is it typically a six-month lag? Is it a 12-month lag? Can you speak to that a little bit? Or is it more efficient than that, right? Is it shorter than that? So if you're saying, hey, John, we are back to where we were in February, to me, that's kind of interesting. Now, I don't really know what that data means, but I think it'd be really valuable to understand how quickly does this money move with changing times, right? Or with the market? 
Yeah, I wish I could put a nice answer on that. It's a really tough question to answer because the times that weren't are very unprecedented, right? I mean, let's just look at the stock market, for example, because the alternative market is all illiquid. Most of the behavior moves off speculation, right? So for example, if you were going to go sell something in real estate today, you would sell it based on your opinion of what's to come, not what just happened, right? You may be using today's facts, right? I.e. we're in a pandemic and there's a moratorium on eviction. So maybe I don't want to be in the real estate game, but you don't actually know what the end result is of those activities. There's a lag that we have to feel too. So part of that speculation in the stock market, it's very weird because there's always an element of speculation, right? A new trade war. And so people are going, "Ah, I'm a little bit nervous about that. Let's make some decisions. But we're all a lot smarter. There's a reason why when you open the finance page of Yahoo, they're telling you yesterday's news, not tomorrow's, right? Because you don't really know what happens till it's happened. The thing that's very weird about this market and unprecedented to some degree, when things collapsed in 2007, 8, depending on, you know, where you start, where you end, it was pretty painfully obvious that we were headed downward. We didn't know where the bottom was. and We didn't know how long it was going to take us to get there. If you go back to early March, when the market tanked, dropped 35, 45%, depending on the indice that you read, it was like overnight. It seemed like it was like a week. And then all of a sudden, a month later, it's shooting back up. I mean, this V-shaped recovery, I read something that said the stock market's going up in the middle of a recession. And I thought, well, pick one. You know, we can't be in the middle of a recession if things are going up like that. So there's a disjoinment from reality. It's very unprecedented. And when I look at the market, it almost clouds the water even more. And it scares me a little bit. And I'm not a pessimist by trade. But when Tesla is valued at more than Walmart, I start to really question what kind of investment euphoria we're living in. Are we in a fundamentally sound investment environment where people are buying investments or people just buying based out of irrational motive? They've got money to invest. And I don't have to look farther than Tesla to know that a company with $365 million of net profit compared to a company with $18 billion of net profit, they're not even in the same zip code. And to suggest that that the one that's worth the most is the smaller of the two, fundamentally things have shifted. Now, part of that's the way the world is moving. So to answer your question and kind of bring it back to it, we don't know. And when you add in the pandemic, if this was a traditional cycle where we saw stuff slipping and it wasn't a pandemic, I think we would continuing to be on a decline right now. And for how long, who knows? But I think it's probably, if I had to put an answer on it, six to 12 months, because people are starting to look now at what's transpiring and understanding what that behavior will likely become. And they'll wait a little bit to validate that, see a few more trends before they start making those decisions. And then the average investor will catch up. That's about 10% of the investors. The other 80% are playing catch up to those 10% that are a little bit further out in front of everybody. Okay, cool. So that's how I would look at that as well, right? I mean, there's definitely a lag. It's usually six to 12 months. And it's really interesting that the money is chasing that lag or maybe helping to stay parallel with that lag. But you know, you mentioned something really interesting. You talked a little bit about Wall Street. So I'm going to contrast some of what you said. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay, but also I'm going to contrast what you talked about to real estate. Okay. And I think this is going to be kind of a, a fun conversation. So think about this, right? Very ironic that we're in a recession and, you know, the stock market goes from 30% negative to now, you know, over that it made up ground and some, right? But very interesting that where those gains started to take shape was from all the debt now, or in this case, all the money being injected back into the market by the federal government, right? Essentially refinancing a lot of the more expensive bonds out there that were already at historically low prices. Right now, the money is almost free. So very interesting, right? Because now the way that I look at that and many others are looking at that is the markets are going up. So right, more people buying equities as a function of more money out there that can be deployed at less expensive cost, right? So essentially, you know, you refinance relatively expensive bond at almost 0% and there are your profits right there. (laughs) I mean, it's just some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen, right? I mean, just some of the absolutely craziest stuff I've ever seen. But who's to say that those earnings now are going to get redeployed back out into the marketplace for additional investment, right? Either two things are going to happen. That money's going to get reinvested back into the companies, right? Plow back. They're going to get plowed back 
earnings are going to get plowed back into those companies or those equities, okay? Or those distributions are going to be made back to the investors. And in theory, the investors are now going to take that and redeploy that capital elsewhere. So what the market is saying is we see more of one of the two or both of those things happening, which to me is very interesting because in theory, most of that profit is happening as a result of a refinance. (laughs) I mean, just absolutely wild, right? Okay, so let's now contrast that to real estate, okay? And you invest in multifamily real estate and, you know, you are a investor. You've been in this space for a long time. So you have the, probably the opportunity to be able to look at deals through different lenses, right? So when you contrast the equities market or the stock market to say, for example, now real estate, what attracts you to one versus the other? And then we'll start wrapping this up because we're getting towards the end of the show, but I think this would be a great conversation. Well, so I'm naturally attracted to real estate over equities. I always have been. I probably always will be because the guessing and underlying risk, in my opinion, is removed in real estate and it's always an inherent risk in the stock market. I don't have the first clue what causes these investments to go up, why people are going crazy over Apple today versus three months ago, six months ago, 12 months ago is beyond me. Same thing with Tesla or any other company. I understand groups like Netflix and Amazon that are benefactors of this work from home, live from home, Zoom. So I can wrap my arms around those few companies. The other 95%, it's a fool's game, right? It's like blackjack. I don't know the next card that's coming. And so I don't mind taking some money that I'm willing to throw away and put it there, but I certainly don't want to put my hard-earned money on that table because I can't control the outcome. Real estate, while I don't control every bit of the outcome, I have lots of control over it. I can look at an apartment complex and know that if we buy this for $10 million, right, and we leverage this percentage of it, and our total cost of ownership, right, today is X per month, I can take the number of doors that we have and I can calculate out if we rent it for this much, I pay my bills at 60%. If we rent it for this much, I pay them at 80%. If we rent it for this much, I pay it at 90 And You can pro forma this stuff out based on true, easy to understand behavior. I'm not suggesting that the underwriting of an apartment deal is easy, but the logic behind it in theory is very simplistic. How much can we rent it for? How much does it cost us to own? If people stop renting, what's the cost and risk to us? So from that standpoint, I can go in there and say, If the economy stays the way it is and everybody's making money and everybody's got a job, right? Then I can perform at 80 plus percent, maybe 90 percent, and I can make money. If the economy goes to hell in a handbasket or worse, a pandemic hits and 30 something million people are unemployed, likely those are people that are going to be in service industries and things that are apartment complex residents today. What's my occupancy till I'm at risk? And I can always increase occupancy by reducing costs. So I always have a way to continue to sell my product. Now, it doesn't mean I can make money forever. I may take losses, but I know what that is going into it. Uh, whether you do that in single family, whether you do that in a 20 unit you know, building or a 200 unit building, the math is the same. It's just got a few more bits of information. But at the end of the day, I make money on rent. I make passive income, whether it be single family or multifamily. If I own a stock, I get zero unless it goes up or goes down. So if the stock goes down, I got nothing to show for it. If I buy a piece of real estate and it goes down, it doesn't matter. If I'm still getting 800 bucks a month for my three bedroom, two bath, single family home, I can't recoup that money. I can recoup appreciation. So at the end of the day, I love real estate because it's the only investment that I'm aware of that gives me that level of control. It doesn't mean it's bad, but I get cash flow and appreciation. Those are some really good points. You know, the biggest thing that I heard you say there is the real estate markets are much more transparent, right? It's really interesting because when we think about the stock market, okay, one of the realities that I came to many years ago when I was much younger then, but lost a lot of money in the stock market, and that's a whole nother story. I think I was like 21 or 22 years old. It's like my first hundred grand, right? I'm like, yes. And so I used grandma stockbroker. That was no. (laughs) Oh, so, okay, fast forward. All right, fast forward. So you talk about that level of transparency, okay? And one of the things that I've learned over the years, no matter how I looked at this, I had to come to the reality that me investing in a stock into a company, okay, that's traded on Wall Street, compared to a billion-dollar hedge fund 
we just are going to have our levels of information are going to be very different, right? Because they can sit someone on the board. They're in those quarterly meetings for a reason, right? They have a lot of influence and typically their ownership of that company is much larger than mine's going to be. So the level of transparency is very different. Now, in the real estate markets, though, to your point, a much more transparent, right? And people are going to argue this all day long. I have a very different view of this, that the reason for that is a lack of inefficiency. I totally disagree. I think if the market is transparent, it's just transparent, right? And so real estate markets, I think a lot more transparent because of what you talked about earlier, just the ability to be able to influence more variables, okay, as an investor. Whether you're a big investor or a small investor, the point there being is if you have ownership in a real estate investment, so long as you have good management with good reporting, the level of information is relatively the same, or meaning it's more transparent in the real estate world. Would you agree with that? Oh, without a doubt. And transparency also is coupled with ability to comprehend and understand. Uh, The the average lay investor can understand what rent is, what a mortgage payment is, what repairs are. It's common nature. We already live in real estate. Can you understand or comprehend, you know, how Microsoft earns money and what their price earning ratios are and all these things and market cap? They, They just get very difficult for the average investor to understand. So you mean one plus one equals two? You know, it, uh, it seems like it should. And when I do math, that's how I like it to work too. But uh, yeah. Or do you want to do you want to get into the, com- the the complex explanation around synergy? One plus one should equal four. Right. <laughs> I'd rather stick with the two, right? I'd rather stick with the two. Well, hey, bud, Jason, you've been a tremendous guest, and this has been a great conversation. I know it's going to add a lot of value to a lot of folks out there. And for those who are not aware that you can actually self-direct your 401k, your IRA for that matter, I'm sure now the wheels are turning and many people are going to start looking to that as a possibility for continuing to build and expand their wealth. So I want to thank you for participating. Before we ask our audience or ask you to share your information, do you have one question that you'd like to ask me that you feel may add value to our audience at this point? Yeah, I guess... Just at face value, you know, I, and this is, I'm asking this for me as well, and I'll assume the audience is thinking the same thing, but what's the number one thing that you look for in a real estate deal? Uh, let's see. That's a great question because there could be a couple things, but let me share this from the viewpoint of a buyer, right? Me acquiring the property, looking for a reason why I should purchase thing to hold okay, and to operate, all right? The number one thing I look for is a problem to solve. That's the number one thing, okay? If there aren't very many problems to solve or if there isn't a problem to solve, to me, I equate that to very little opportunity for me to add value. And in a world where, and I just talked about this the other day, where investors have options, right? I have an opportunity cost of capital, just like a bank does, just like another investment company does. I look for the best opportunities through which to place our capital, right? Meaning my capital alongside my investor's capital. And so for me, I always gravitate towards when I'm having conversations and understanding that there's a problem for me to solve inside of that deal, which usually equates to more upside, more opportunity, et cetera. Well, I love that. I absolutely. I've never heard that before. So thank you for giving me that to the feedback. I'm sure your you know, listeners as well will probably can use that. That's powerful. Very, very powerful. I appreciate that. And when you think about it, right, you think about the greatest income earners in the United States, it's because they've solved some very complex problems, right? Now, there's always a balance between knowing where and how to spend your time solving problems. So What we do and what I spend a lot of my time doing is figuring out that balance and making sure that there's a problem we can solve that will get a good return on our time, energy, and money. I love it. That's the idea. Well, hey, bud, you've been a gracious, gracious guest. Great information. How do people get a hold of you if they want to reach out and learn a little bit more about what you folks do? So the the easiest way is really to continue kind of your educational journey into self-direction is to visit our website, newviewtrust.com. It's Newview with a U, N-U-V-I-E-W, trust.com. 
on that website, uh, you'll find obviously plenty of information, but there's a blog section there. I'd encourage everybody to go click on, and there's just a tremendous amount of content, educational content that you can find there, videos. You know, we do a lot of webinars and variety of subjects. So that'd be by far the best place to go if you want to get to me directly. My email is j for Jason Debono, my last name, D E B O N O, at newviewtrust.com. Awesome, bud. Thanks again for being just a great guest and for the willingness to share your insights. I found all of them very valuable, and I know our audience will as well. So I will talk to you soon, but I look forward to your continued success. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. Good to be here. Anytime. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.